Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast.
Praise God. Appreciate that. I've been wrestling with the Lord all morning because uh, what I have for the thoughts I've been having don't sound very connected to Easter, but that's all right. We're not tied to the calendar. Uh, and yet it is in a way. I was actually going to the book of Ruth of all places, but yet it does illustrate, I believe, some of the very things that Mike was talking about in a very profound way. You know, how many of you have, uh, have read very much in the book of Judges? Yeah, it's pretty ugly, isn't it? Uh, a lot of stuff. You see the people in terrible condition, constantly drifting into idolatry and God sending judgment and sending deliverers, and even the deliverers weren't all that much to shout about sometimes. I mean, the Lord blessed Gideon, but he, he had his faults too. But you see God's mercy and God's faithfulness. But the one thing that, uh, that struck me as I got to the end of Judges and started reading Ruth the other day was the fact that this took place in the middle of all that. So in the middle of all that God and all that was wrong with the nation, God had a people, didn't he? God always had a remnant of people who were faithful to him and who believed in him, who trusted in him. And this was a story about that. And of course, just to give you quickly the, the background of it, uh, you remember that there was uh, a man in Bethlehem in Judah and uh, he and his wife and his, his two sons uh, went to live in the, in the neighboring country of Moab, and they did it because, there, because of circumstances. You, Mike was talking about how Lord arranging circumstances. Well, this was one where he allowed them to experience a famine in Judah, and so they had to go over to Moab to, to try to survive. And, uh, you know, they, and so they settled there, and over a period of some years, uh, they had two sons, Malon and Kilion, and they married a couple of, of Moabite girls. And so life was good and you know, they, were hang, they were going on and all of a sudden, well, over a period of time, I don't know how sudden it was, but all three of the men died. So now you've got a widow named Naomi and her, her two foreign daughters-in-law living there. And uh, you know, I'm sure they were struggling for their existence and things were you know, not great, but th then all of a sudden, uh, Naomi heard that things had changed back home, and so she said, I'm going to go home. And that's the background of it. And so uh, on, they were on the road, and actually her two daughters, daughters-in-law were so attached to her at this point that they actually began to follow her, didn't they? And so uh, in verse 8 it says, Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back to you with your people. So at this point, both of them are still attached to her enough that they want to go back. Obviously, they had seen something in her. Now, perhaps it was, well, you'll see as you go along that uh, I, I'm sure both of them liked her. Both of them felt safe in her company, and they, they felt a natural attraction to her as a person. But there came a point where they, they went in two different directions, didn't they? And so here's the, uh, the circumstance that God had arranged. It says, but Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who would, could, could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait for them till they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. And so, I mean, she's laying out how it really is here. And I'll tell you, there's a principle that you see throughout the scriptures when it comes to people coming to God, and that is counting the cost. Because there is a cost in serving God. It, you have to have the real goods if you're going to follow him and, take, and be separated from this world. You've got to have something beyond affection for somebody, beyond any natural tie. And this was what was uh, what the Lord was the Lord was arranging a circumstance. Now the, the glorious thing about all of this is that God, from the very beginning, you can see His hand. You know, we, we can read the whole story now, so we know we can say, "Hey, you know, hang on, it's going to be okay." But they didn't know that at the time. They're, they're, as far as they were concerned, they saw no particular reason 
to go forward. There was no natural, natural thing that could have caused either one of these girls to continue on their journey. But God had had from the beginning his eye upon a girl, a foreign girl. He loved her. He planned for her. He had, talk about the Lord having plans. The Lord had plans for that girl that she had no concept of. But in order to bring her into that, he had to first strip away every other consideration and say, you know, what is your life really about? Where are you, what do you really want? And I, and I sense, I, I don't know, I, I have nobody particular in mind here today, but I just, I just felt this, this burden to say, to say these things and, and what the Lord does with it, that's up to him. But you know, pray. We've got people in our midst that haven't really made up their mind. They haven't really seen. And you gotta see something. In this world, you know, it's, it's too easy in America to, to join a church and think you're a Christian. But, you know, the, what's going to happen if the day comes when it's not like that? Are you going to have what it takes? Well, at this point, at this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But what did she kiss her? Goodbye. She kissed her goodbye. But Ruth... You know, if you got the right thing and you, you can't, people can't run you off. Because you're not there because of, because somebody has sweet talked you or tried to persuade you or because you have some natural attachment. You are there because you see something that is, that you can't let go. It can't, it has, it's got a hold in your heart and your life. It's a conviction. It's a God given conviction. And you know, you, you don't really see, other than the result, we don't see the dealings of God with this girl's heart. But somehow, somewhere, she had not only developed an attachment of affection for her mother-in-law, she saw something in her about the God of Israel that she served. And so it made every bit of the difference you know, we can have people grow up here, and you're here because, well, it's expected. You're here for a lot of reasons. You might like somebody. You might like the people you hang out with. You've got a whole lot of natural reasons. But I'll tell you, God has a way. As Mike said, God has a way of arranging circumstances to bring people to what? To real, true conviction and faith. And it has to be a revelation. As I say, all we can surmise is from the context of Scripture and from the result that we see in Ruth's response that we're about to read, Ruth saw something that Orpah did not. Now, how does that happen? I mean, how does it happen that one person sees and another one doesn't? God has to reveal it. God has to deal with a heart. And you know, I, you got folks out there that think that when God deals with the heart, it's inevitable. Well, I'll tell you what, we've got a will. We've got to have to, we're going to have to yield. There's going to have to be choices made. God brings conviction a lot of, on a lot of people who, who, who go like this, and they run from it. To them, it's a terrible thing. To them, it's a, oh, what God is expecting from me is unfair. It's, un, it's just, you know, I want, I want this. How many of you have seen people who... Uh, when there's a real call to sa about salvation, some message about salvation, they run to the front and they, they cry and they cry and they cry. And then nothing really changes. You know what those tears are really about? It's, I know I need Jesus, but I want my life so bad that I'm not willing to give it up. And, you know, I, I know somehow it's, it's obvious to me that Orpah here had such an affection for her mother-in-law that it really broke her heart that she couldn't have it both ways. But she was, what was she looking at? What was her, when she was evaluating her situation and making her choice, what was it that she saw? She saw strictly the earthly issues. How am I gonna make it? What am I gonna do? I want a husband, all natural desires, and, and just, she saw no prospects going forward. In spite of her affection, that wasn't enough to hold her. And so she, and though, though she had that deep yearning, a deep love and wanting to be with Naomi, she, had, she knew there was something there, but yet it wasn't enough to really hold her. And so she, when she uh, wept, she kissed her goodbye. But Ruth said, don't urge me to leave you. You know, stop it. 
I understand you're, you're really putting me to the test here. God's arranged a circumstance where I, I, nothing looks pleasant here. There's no prospects that I have. But, just, but stop it. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Now here's a dimension that is often overlooked. Your people will be my people. And your God, my God. Do you, understand, do you know that God has people in the earth? Well, you know, when you get down to it, they're not, very, they're not much. We don't have anything to brag about. But I tell you, God has people in the earth. They're, they're flawed. They're in all kinds, of, all kinds of the process, stages of the process of God working in hearts and lives to change us into what he intends that we become. But I'll tell you, there's a people who have something on the inside that says there's no place else to go. That's it. It doesn't matter whether, it, whether, it looks, whether, whether things look promising or they don't. I know. I know God is real. How many of you have tried to put, put that aside and say, I'm just going to, I'm mad at God. I'm going to do this. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do this anymore. How many of you have ever, how many would admit it? You know, that you've experienced. Yeah, well, see, Ron's got the courage. I'll, I'll admit it too. Yeah, there's times that we just get so disgusted with this issue or that issue that we just, you know, I'm mad at God. This isn't worthwhile. How does that work out? Not at all. It doesn't work. Why? Because I know. I, there's something down in there. There's a conviction that's been formed because God put it there. Somewhere along the line, God formed a conviction with me. I can't do anything else. It doesn't matter how my emotions go or what my circumstances are. I have nowhere else to go. You know, what is it that has held God's people down through the ages except a conviction that God is real? And that they are far better off being identified with God and with his people than they are anywhere else. And so you see this conviction, your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. I mean, that's pretty strong conviction right there. Only God can give somebody a conviction. Folks, we are not dependent. You and I are not dependent on the strength of our wills when it comes to this. This happens when God begins to deal with a heart, and that heart, instead of going like this, says, yes, Lord. And it begins to yield, and it softens, and the ground becomes plowed up, and the circumstances of life brings, bring a softening towards God instead of a hardness and a bitterness. And then God plants the seed of real conviction and faith there and it begins to come up and God waters that and he prepares it and so when the trials and the tests of life come you know there's no other place to go praise God now you look at how what an utter choice this really was because Orpah didn't just go home for better earthly prospects she went back to her gods her people, her gods. It was an entirely separate people. How many of you know there are really two kinds of people in the world? It's not good and bad people. We're all bad. We just, some of us, you know, understand that and know we need a Savior. And God's working in us. But the truth is there are God's, God is calling out a people. They are a people who have a conviction that this world is not their home this world system is something to be turned away from and run from like poison. It is, it's the, the world is destined for the fire and its inhabitants to perish. And there are gods in this world. You know, I, on the one hand, you have the, the kingdom of darkness that rules over the hearts and lives of men. You think you're free? You know, I, I, I think I mentioned before, but I've met people who don't think they have to serve either God or the devil. There's no choice. If you don't serve God, you are serving the devil. You are a part of a world that is married to its own desires, its own ways, its, and their mind is on earthly things. And I'll tell you, people like that, that's, they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. And that means simply they don't want to die. They don't want to let go. They don't see the value of letting go. They, utter, they don't see the deliverance that God has wrought through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
to absolutely set us free from something, unless he opens your eyes to what it really is, it will still hold its appeal to you, and you'll still want to go and do, do things its way. But oh, I'll tell you, there's a, there, God is, is absolutely in this hour, I believe, and he's done it in every hour. Whenever he's dealt with a heart, it's like Mike says, there, he's going to arrange the circumstances to where you and I are going to make a radical choice. It's either me and my life in this world doing, doing things the way I want to do them, or I'm going to let go, and I'm going to serve God, and I'm going to trust in him. I'm going to put all the issues of life in his hands to do with me as he will, to arrange my life as he will. You know, he can put somebody on a throne or he can put them in, the, you know, in, in extreme poverty. But I'll tell you, I would rather be, well, as, as David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I'll tell you, you can't say that unless you really see, unless God has opened your eyes to see the difference. But I'll tell you, when, when Orpah said no, it wasn't just no to Naomi, it was no to the God who would have drawn her in and made her a part of his covenant people. And here's this poor little heathen girl named Ruth. Somehow God had birthed in her such a conviction that in spite of the fact there, was, there were no prospects that she could possibly have discerned at that time. All she knew was she was going to stick with the stuff and come hell or high water, come poverty or whatever. She, she wasn't leaving, period. I'm with you th through thick and thin. But, oh, I'll tell you, God had plans for her, didn't he? His love, it was his love that had brought her to such a conviction. And she became one of the more honored people in the scriptures. There's a whole book devoted to her story. Oh, I'll tell you, you can't lose serving the Lord. And I don't care what the temporary circumstances are that, that involve laying down our lives and saying, no, oh, the reward is eternal. Praise God. Do we have something to live, to, to live for this morning? Yeah. Praise the Lord. And of course, you know, the rest of the story, how God brought her to the attention of, of one of uh, Naomi's relatives, a, a, a wealthy man named Boaz, and he was uh, in the middle of his harvest, and she went out and harvested in his fields, and he took note of her. And, you know, her reputation had, had gone before her. Everybody knew about this young woman and how she had made that radical choice. There was already a respect for this woman. God had put that in the hearts of his people. That tells me God had some people. They weren't all bad. They weren't all a bunch of idolaters. God had some people who had some real conviction about serving him. And so God absolutely worked one thing after another after another. She wasn't out saying, how can I get, how can I get ahead? How can I do this? She wasn't scheming. She wasn't doing anything. Just trusting God and doing what came, came to her hand. And you see God maneuver one step at a time until she winds up as Boaz's wife. And God blesses them and they have a, a son named Obed. Obed had a son named Jesse. And Jesse had a son named David. And all of a sudden you have, you have this heathen girl brought in, given a divine revelation. And, and, she, and, they begin to, and she steps right into the line of God's eternal purpose, and she actually was one of the progenitors of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the flesh. I'll tell you, we serve a great God. We serve a God who is worthy to be served, whatever the cost. But, oh, God is going to bring every soul that he brings to himself to that point. Which are you going to go? Which way are you going to go? And I don't, know who's, I don't know who this may apply to. I have no idea. But somehow it just, I cannot shake it. And so, you know, halting words, whatever is going to come out. That's, I, I pray that God will absolutely convict somebody. Because when he does, it's his love, it's his mercy, even as it was in the case of Ruth, to give her a conviction. A conviction, we think of it as a negative thing. Oh, God, I've got to face my sins. I've got to face all this. Yeah, that's part of it. But the conviction is not just that you're a sinner needing a Savior. The conviction is that Jesus Christ is a Savior who is worthy to be served and, to, and worthy of your life. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD, 
or a CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. DVDs are $10 and CDs are $5. And for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your request to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at the same time, and may God richly bless you until then.